Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We'll just let everybody join here. And while you're joining, if you could just put where you're joining from, it's always, always fun to see the, ge the geographic uh, distribution of the attendees. So I'm coming from uh, cloudy Bend, Oregon today. I think Jacob it's, it's, it's pretty sunny here in Boston today, which is nice. <laughs> Zachary Sacramento. He's our guest. We had a fun little discussion beforehand. He was originally from Bend. So awesome. Let's give it a minute here. Do appreciate everybody joining. And uh, yeah, it's a fun series, you know, to make sure to keep coming back for more. If you're a fan of Saul, he is on uh, vacation. So I have to put up with Jacob. People need a break from me every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, we did get a little bit of a break from you. Yeah, uh, look, oh, we're ready to go. We got we got David's here. So I mean, that's always my my marker. It's David joins us. So. Adam, Austin, Texas. Yeah, oh, we got Sweden in the house too. Enkoping, I, I can't even pronounce it. Enkoping, Shopping, I believe right. it is. Uh, do you mean uh, from me or? Jön Shopping. <laughs> there yeah. we go. Yeah. Excellent. This All is right. the, lovely, the lovely Swedish letters O, E, Ö. <laughs> yes, if you have a O with two dots, it's Ö. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah. Mm. All right, we're, we're going to get this, this party started here. I um, want to welcome everybody to today's uh, Autodesk Community Conversation. It's the Dynamo and Civil 3D API with Jacob Small and special guest Zachary Jensen. My name is Sean Hurley. I'm your community host. All right, community conversations are virtual meetups featuring expert speakers from across the community. Sessions range from deep dives, tips and tricks, and uh, live demonstrations on products and, such as AutoCAD, Revit. We got Dynamo here, uh, Fusion 360, Emerging Trends, a little bit of everything and uh, all experience levels. Um, some of them might be a little bit deeper. We're gonna start to indicate which ones are more deeper topics for the beginners or where to start. Uh, I'll just note that the Dynamo, this is number 29. So there's 29 in this series you can watch on YouTube. And over that series, Jake, uh, Jacob, would, would you agree that somebody would be able to be a pretty good master of Dynamo over that? It's kind of starts out in the shallow end of the pool and moves to the deeper. Yeah, and that, that was really the way we, why we structured it the way we did. We wanted people to be able to build to the point that we're getting into today where we're really diving deep into the uh, the API and Civil 3D and uh, a couple of weeks back when we did the deeper dive into Revit. So um, awesome. yes, start at the beginning if you've got questions. <laughs> yeah, and then maybe we maybe we think about doing more shallow into the pool every once in a while. Otherwise, you're going to be on a, a constantly escalating thing. And before long, you're going to be doing physics or something in Dynamo. So don't, don't run yourself into that uh, difficult situation. So. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Just some, some uh, rules and norms. Uh, the uh, safe harbor statement just means that anything we say here that isn't in the shipping product, that you make any purchase decisions based on the products as they are today. So, um, and that, that's, that's, that's about the bottom of it, you know, products as they are shipping today. Um, also, Zachary is not an Autodesk employee, so his opinions, are his and not Autodesk. So next, please. Just the simple things here. Everybody's lines are muted to reduce background noise, dog barking, babies crying, that kind of stuff. Um, we invite you to turn on your camera where possible, kind of gives us that in-person feeling. Um, and hopefully you'll join us at AU this year. Um, in September, we, we hope to have a community conversation in person. That would be really fun. Um, we could high five speakers or maybe just throw things at Jacob. Yeah, might be fun. 
Um, <laughs> this is a conversation, so raise your hand using the Zoom function, the reactions down in the bottom right, or you can ask in the chat and when the speakers have a break in there, I'll interrupt them or they will jump in and, and answer them. So we would like to repeat these in audio so that everybody watching the recordings get the benefit of the chat questions. Uh, the session is recorded and the recording will be posted both, both on the event page where you registered here, as well as in YouTube. There is a, uh, a what do you call it? A series, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing Playlist. a blank on it. A playlist, that's it, thank you, Jacob. Um, and I'll put those links uh, in the chat here in a bit and also put those on the event page so that you can bookmark those. There's some good resources. So next, please. The fun stuff. The sad stuff is you've got grayed out Saul there, but uh, I'm Sean Hurley, Autodesk Community Engagement Manager. I'm a geeky technologist in Bend, Oregon. And I'm Jacob Small. I am no longer a designated sports specialist. I still forget to update my title. I am now a technical consultant focusing on generative design uh, for Autodesk Consulting Organization. Uh, describe myself as a Dynamo form junkie uh, and based out of Boston, Mass. Zach? Hey, everyone. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm Zachary Jensen. You can just you can call me Zach. Um, I, <clears throat> I am a civil engineer um, and amateur software developer, um, always, always learning, but um, I, my title is technology innovation engineer um, here at Wood Rogers in Sacramento. Um, and I like to describe myself as an engineer, kind of a blending of those two, two uh, titles I used earlier. But anyway, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, there's a lot of familiar names here and really excited to, to chat with you all. So thanks for coming. Great. It's, I'm really excited to have you, uh, as I think I've made it clear a few times now. But let's get into it. All right. So this session is all about Civil 3D, Dynamo and Civil 3D's API. So uh, we're going to be looking at using uh, Dynamo, in particular, the Python node uh, to really push um, uh, content into the DWG format, be it Civil 3D content or AutoCAD content, kind of at a high level. Uh, but before we get into there, I wanted to just take a brief look back because we're talking about automating Civil 3D and AutoCAD. So it's maybe good to have a little bit of history here. Um, I don't know if anybody's aware, but Dynamo for Civil 3D launched a bit over three years ago. Does anyone want to take a guess what year AutoLisp launched? Any, any thoughts? Go ahead and put them in the chat. I'm going to count to five, one, two, three, four, five. Look at all those flying in. And hey, Adam, I think you got that one right. I think you were the first one to hit in there. 1986, January of 1986 was the introduction of Autolisp, uh, which is really, really impressive because that actually means that people have been automating AutoCAD stuff for more than 36 years now. Uh, there was macros. Ah, oh, yeah, there, you're right. There was macros probably before that, right? So we've got a lot of history here in this particular space. And um, as a result, it's worth noting that your company has likely been automating AutoCAD stuff for potentially more than 36 years if you had a company that's been around for a while. Uh, those previous automations are really, really important because you can learn a lot from them, even though they might not be doing Dynamo stuff. Go, grab them, pull them together, set stuff up, make it work in the new format so that you can sort of build there, you know, learn, stand on the shoulders of those giants who sort of came before you. All right. So now that we've got that out of the way, what are we going to cover today? We're going to give a 20 minute or so presentation on Dynamo and Civil 3D's APIs. Uh, we're going to give a bit of a live demonstration. This is actually not going to be me this week. It's going to be Zachary. So I'm, a, I'm excited to just get to sit back and watch and, uh, be the peanut gallery in the background there. Uh, and then we're gonna get into question and answers. And as always with the Dynamo uh, community conversations and office hours, go ahead and put those questions in the chat as we go. Uh, and we keep a pretty good eye on them uh, as we go along. 
All right, so first off, let's frame the topic here. Um, what is an API? How to, basically, they're how programs talk to each other. An API is an app, stands for Application Programming Interface. It's sort of structured in a way for one program to offer services to other programs. Uh, in the case of like a website API, these programs are sort of running on different machines. Your machine sends a request for information in a particular format out to that other machine a server at like Facebook or uh, Autodesk Forge or wherever it else may be, uh, will receive that content and send that back, right? Um, uh, in the case of desktop applications, it's kind of a one way for a program to interact directly with other tools that are direct uh, on the system that you're using. So APIs can either be in process or out of process. Uh, the in process tool is where it runs kind of atop the primary process. So in those cases, if uh, Civil 3D uh, locks up and Dynamo's an in process integration with Civil 3D, Dynamo will lock up as well. Uh, there's also out of process uh, integrations. Uh, an example of this would be uh, Formit and uh, or uh, Design Automation or Alias, where we can continue to use Alias while Dynamo's doing a heavy calculation or continue to use format while Dynamo is doing heavy calculations. There's really big benefits to each, um, right? Uh, you can sort of think uh, primarily one being stability. Uh, if you're in process, it's much less likely for things to get sent to the uh, application kind of out of sequence, causing everything to crash, corruption, or loss of data. Nobody likes those words, right? Uh, it's also a little bit uh, quicker in uh, many instances. Uh, but that does mean that Dynamo can only work with those uh, applications when they're integrated uh, uh, directly as uh, an in-process piece. It can only work when the applicate host applications kind of sitting idle. So you got to be real careful uh, kind of about that. All right, Zach, uh, can you tell us kind of a little bit more about where these APIs might live? Yeah. So one thing I wanted to touch on here, um, we up until now we've been talking, even the title of this presentation has been, you know, AutoCAD and the, the AutoCAD and Civil 3D API as in it's a singular Thing. And, and one thing I wanted to touch on here um, that I think is really important um, to start off with is that they're, first of all, AutoCAD and, and Civil 3D are two, essentially two completely separate um, applications, if you will. So even though when you, you launch it, it all looks like kind of this one thing, um, kind of on the back end, when we're talking about APIs, AutoCAD and Civil 3D have two completely separate um, APIs. And that's kind of why I put this little graphic here. You can see um, in the Dynamo library, there's the, the two shelves for AutoCAD and Civil 3D separately is really because of that reason, because there's um, you, you access them through two different um, back doors, if you will. So when we say the API, well, AutoCAD actually has five APIs. Um, AutoLisp, like we mentioned, that's that's, that's an obvious one that probably everybody has experience with. Um, there's also the object ARX, which stands for um, Auto, AutoCAD Runtime Extension, um, which is essentially the C++ API. Um, there is the .NET API. Um, then there's the ActiveX and COM API. And then the, the latest one, um, newest one to the party, is the JavaScript API. Then Civil 3D has three APIs. It has a .NET API, a COM API, um, and then a, maybe a lesser known one is a custom draw API, which is how you can customize how Civil 3D objects are drawn and displayed. Um, so when we say the API, and especially when we're talking about in the context of Dynamo, we are referring to the .NET APIs. Not that the other ones are you know, not useful or outdated by any means, they're useful for different things, but in the context of Dynamo, I just want to make it clear, we're talking about the .NET APIs. Let's go to the next slide, Jacob. So that term, .NET, you've probably heard of it, but if you're like me, coming from maybe an engineering background or um, essentially a non-software development background, you, you may not know what, what the heck is this .NET thing. For a long time, I thought .NET was a language. <laughs> um, so took a little bit of research and, and reading to figure out that it's not. but I wanted to, I put this slide here because maybe you're in a similar place as, as me of and .NET is this kind of nebulous thing. Well, let's put, let's make that a little more concrete. So .NET is a developer platform uh, made up of tools, programming languages, and libraries that you can use to build many different types of applications. And there's, there's a couple different flavors of .NET. Um, there's 
the .NET framework. Um, and then nowadays, Microsoft has been trying to kind of unify everything together into just one singular .NET. For a while, it was called .NET Core. Now it's just .NET. So you might see some stuff on the web of uh, people getting really excited about .NET 6, the most current version. Um, when, when we're working with um, Dynamo, Civil 3D, AutoCAD, we are, we're talking about .NET framework. That's the, that's the flavor that is being used. So unfortunately, you can't really take advantage of a lot of the really cool stuff in, in .NET 6 and some of the newer cross-platform cross stuff. Um, but .NET Framework is still, you know, a really, really awesome platform. So the two major components of .NET Framework are the common language runtime um, and the framework class library, or essentially just a big library of baseline stuff for developers to use um, and libraries to reference um, as, as really the foundation for applications. So, um, like I mentioned before, .NET is not a language, but it supports multiple languages. So Microsoft um, developed and maintains the C Sharp, Visual Basic, and F Sharp languages. Those are kind of the three, the three big ones, I'd say, in, in .NET world. There's technically a bunch of other ones that are supported, but um, those are the three big ones. So what happens when you, when you write code, C Sharp, Visual Basic, or F Sharp, it gets compiled to an assembly or a DLL, you may have seen those. Um, and then from there, when those assemblies are loaded, they get um, essentially executed by what's called the common language runtime that takes all of that and more or less translates it into the machine code that your computer um, actually understands and runs. So the common language runtime is kind of this like common denominator that everything kind of boils down to. Um, let's go to the next slide. So you might, uh, one question you might be is be asking is, hey, what about Python? I didn't see it on that, that list of languages. Um, so when, when you're using Dynamo um, to interact with AutoCAD and Civil 3D, um, you can kind of do it in two ways. You can define and build custom nodes um, that are defined in an assembly or a DLL, or you can, um, you can do it on the fly through a Python node um, which kind of skips the whole process of having to compile that code to a DLL. And there's a, kind of pros and cons to that. A big um, pro to that, I would say, is that you don't, it, it really speeds things up from a kind of a learning perspective because you don't have to take the time to build your application down or, and, and create an assembly, a DLL, and then load it into AutoCAD. That process takes takes time. Python kind of skips that because it's an interpreted language. We can just go straight to the common language runtime like you can see in this diagram. Um, and it makes it easier to iterate faster and, and really to learn quickly. So this is with, um, even though Python, you know, may not always be directly in the discussion of, you know, a .NET language, um, really has some, some pretty cool advantages through Dynamo. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about Python later. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so how do we actually access these APIs? So if you're familiar at all with, with Revit or maybe you listened to some previous uh, presentations, I think last week or the last presentation was, a, was about the Revit API. Um, it's pretty handy because there's just like two DLLs that you have to reference. When you're dealing with AutoCAD and Civil 3D, there's a whole lot more. And when you're starting out, it can be a little confusing of like, which ones do I need to do what I want? Um, and so I'm gonna try and break it down here for you. So you know, okay, if I've got these referenced, I should have my bases covered. So the good news is that you don't have to um, do any special downloads or anything to get these, to get quote, the API. Um, it's all part of, when, when you install Civil 3D, these are all in the program files. Um, so you don't have to download anything separate. Um, you can I'm I'm not going to read them off there, but I put in the in the bullets there the the locations in your program files where these particular DLLs over on the right um, are located. So there's the three um, AutoCAD 
ones are the AC MGD, AC DB MGD, and AC core MGD. You can see there with the, the red highlight. Um, and then there's two more, those two green ones, the AEC base and AEC prop data. So those are technically, those are AutoCAD architecture, um, part of the AutoCAD architecture API, which does come bundled with Civil 3D. Um, those are there, and you'll see those in the Python node template in Dynamo. Those are really there so that you can work with property set data. If you're not working with property set data, you can leave those off, but they're in the, they're in the Python node template just so they're there if you might need them. Um, then with, for Civil 3D, there's basically one that you really need, the AECC DB MGD, um, and that covers most things. But if you're gonna deal with pressure pipes or data shortcuts is the newest one, there's two more there that I listed that you'll, that you'll wanna reference into your, to your application or into Dynamo. Um, one last note, I mentioned you don't need to download anything. It is generally a good idea to download the AutoCAD um, software development kit, the SDK. Um, that has these DLLs in it. They're a little bit stripped down. They don't contain as much um, stuff or some overhead things in them. Um, and so it's, it's referenced in the developer's guide. They say it's a good idea to reference the DLLs from the AutoCAD SDK instead of straight from the program files. But if you do reference them from program files, it's, it's certainly not the end of the world. So, okay, let's keep going. All right, so now that we understand where these DLLs are and how we're sort of gonna access them uh, or what Python needs to access to sort of be able to leverage these, let's talk about how we sort of pull these apart and understand what we can do with these different APIs. Um, these are some really useful resources. I think Sean can uh, paste these in the chat for us. Um, uh, the great thing about these is uh, as web resources, you don't necessarily have to be in the environment to uh, kind of get access to them. Uh, if you're you know, bouncing around, as long as you know where to go, you can start to look. So uh, in, in order, um, the first one is the AutoCAD developer's guide. This is gonna go over your core AutoCAD, again, Civil 3D built on DWG. You're gonna need that AutoCAD sort of base in order to be able to really make use of a lot of those other functions like inserting blocks and stuff like that. Uh, so definitely check that out. Note, if you change that year right there where it says 2023, if you're working in 2022 or 2021 or 2020, if you change that year back, it's gonna allow you to step back to those different years. So uh, if, instead of going to help.autodesk.com slash view slash OARX slash 2023, if you go to slash 2022, it'll get you to the 2022 library. And that's the same thing for the Civil 3D APIs, uh, which is again, uh, helpautodesk.com view civ3d slash 2023. Uh, three. Uh, and then we get into some useful, uh, some other useful web uh, resources. Uh, the first one is through the interface. Uh, this is Keen, uh, uh, Keenan Wamsley's blog. Um, great colleague of mine uh, at Autodesk. He's been uh, doing some really, really amazing stuff with automation uh, for, um, as long as I can remember. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna totally date where, where that stands relative to my time in the industry, but um, it's pretty close to step zero. Um, the other one up there is the Swamp. Uh, this is a helpful community uh, of users that's entirely user led, not in any way associated with Autodesk, uh, but it's got a lot of people sharing a lot of great code similar to what we have on the Dynamo forums. Uh, so it's definitely worth checking those, uh, those two out as well, uh, either for just inspiration or, hey, I understand I need to use this API call, but I can't quite implement it. What do I do? Uh, so definitely check those out as well. And check the comments too, because there's oftentimes a lot of really useful stuff in there. Hey, Jacob, can I, can I jump yeah. in real quick on that? If you go back to that slide. So one thing I just wanted to mention for everybody. So that, uh, that first one there, the AutoCAD developer's guide, that's, that's an absolutely invaluable resource. It's got super good documentation. If you're even just totally starting out from scratch, it's got some really helpful work, uh, workflows with sample code to get you going. Um, definitely go there. And the one other thing I wanted to mention on the dates, the 2023, um, the years there. So the AutoCAD API, um, is pretty stable, really doesn't change too much from release to release. So you can go to the developer's guide for any release year, and it's generally the same. For Civil 3D, it's a little bit more in flux, where there's new features being added to the Civil 3D API or exposed um, 
from year to year, sometimes even in incremental releases like a dot one or a dot two release, there'll be new stuff in the API. And so it does make a difference which um, documentation you're viewing online. So what I do, I just have a bookmark and or several bookmarks in my in my browser for each year. Um, and it's it's important to match it up if you're if you're working in Civil 3D 2021 or 2022. It's important to look at the developer documentation for that matching year because otherwise you might be you might be looking and finding some some items in there that maybe don't exist in your version yet. So just a note there. Awesome, thanks. All right, so we've gone over kind of how to do that stuff. We've talked about stuff we have to sort of load up. Um, I'm gonna use this code here as some basic boilerplate stuff where you can see I'm uh, into Python, importing sys, uh, importing the common language runtime. So I've got access to the Python environment. I've got access to the CLR, a common language runtime. So now I can start to add references to the CLR. Uh, so that I can pull in those libraries back down into the Dynamo Python environment. So that's exactly what we're doing on lines one through line 17, right? Um, after that, we're gonna start to do a couple different things. So in this case, I'm just gonna take my uh, object uh, in from Dynamo as input uh, zero, uh, bring it out as the exact same object. So I bring in a line and I send out a line. No big changes, right? So now let's start looking at how we can get information about what we can do with that without having to go and sort of start clicking through all these pages and pages and pages of data about what we could do with things when we don't necessarily know what things we have. Uh, so the first thing that you can do is you can call for the documentation. So for, to do this, you're gonna take a variable. In this case, I'm taking X as my variable and we're gonna hold that true. Uh, and then just say dot underscore underscore doc, doc, underscore, underscore. And that's gonna basically change it where I've now adjusted my code to call that out and sent that out to the environment. I will now see something like this, right? So this is what is the thing that I have in as plain, a plain enough uh, sort of language is, like, is the way I like to describe it. Now, it looks like it's blank. We'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, the next piece, um, we can pull the directory of all the members associated with an object. So I've got my object as variable X, we can call directory on X, and that will get us what we can do with X, but we aren't giving any sort of direct context into what's what. It's just, here are the things that you could call for, uh, not necessarily how to call for them or what to do with them. So from there, we can call uh, get the directory of all the members on X uh, on my uh, sort of base object, and you can see, we can pull all these different properties and there's some methods in there, maybe even a constructor or two, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but X, it's important to note, can be anything. It could be an object, it could be a class, it could be a function, it could be a property. This isn't unique to AutoCAD, this is based in Python, uh, right? The other big piece, your context matters. So running the exact same series of outputs in a transaction inside a transaction is gonna get us something very different. And this is, has to do with the wrapping and Zachary is gonna go over this a uh, little bit further on as we get going. So you can see here, I've started now a transaction at line 23. We've set our CAD object to be that other piece and we've set the CAD object to the output. I now see autodesk.autocad.databaseservices.line. It's a different thing, right? Uh, and if we go ahead and we uh, sort of pull the documentation on what that is, it tells us this is a line takes a uh, 3D point and a 3D point to sort of define the line as one constructor, or we could just say line and leave it blank as our second, right? Uh, the next thing we can do is we can pull the members, take the CAD members is equal to the directory of members for the CAD object. And that gets us everything that we can do with these, this piece. So now that we've got this content, what can we do from here? So if we zoom in real tight on this, you can see we've got autodesk.autocad.databaseservices.line. There's two important things here. The first piece, everything that happens in that sort of orange box there that I apparently got backwards on my highlighting, uh, that orange box is our database services, uh, is the namespace, right? So we can go and we can look up the namespace and find out what's in that namespace. And then the other piece is the actual function or class. And you can sort of see that content there. Uh, what that means is I can go into my web browser, as we noted before, go to our help documentation, start with the .NET reference guide, find the namespace. So we're gonna to go to the, not the developer's guide, but the reference guide. We're then gonna go down and find our application namespace. There we go, database services namespace. 
I can expand that out and scroll down there, or I could scroll over there on the right to find the actual uh, class that I'm working with or function that I'm working with. Uh, once I get there, I can click on it. It will bring me there. Notice it's bringing me there over on the left as well. So we can then expand out and see what can we do with those? Can, what properties do we have? What constructors do we have, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, from there, we can click on any one and get more information about it. So once we click on that one, we can start to sort of really understand what it is that we can do. How can we modify these things? How can we get new information? And how can we start to drive an application forward? All right, Zach, over to you. OK. So I wanted to uh, show this graphic here to try to give you a little bit of a visual rep representation of kind of the, the object um, hierarchy within the AutoCAD API. And then the next slide is the Civil 3D API. So at the root level, way over on the left, there's there's the application object. Within that, there's the document manager object that kind of holds all of the documents that, that are open in your, in your AutoCAD session. Within that, you then have access to the individual documents. And then each document has a database um, that contains all of the, the data <laughs> uh, in, your, in your drawing. Um, within that, there's, there are a couple tables. Uh, there's the block table, there's the layer table, and there's a dim style table. Um, within each table, there are records. So you just think of like a Excel spreadsheet with columns and rows. Um, and um, so there's block table records, layer, a layer table record, for example, is, is basically just a layer in the term, like if you open up your layers palette, each one of those is a, a layer table record um, from, the, from API speak. Um, and then a, a block table record is a is a block or a block definition um, that you might edit in the block editor. Um, and then within the block, you finally get, or excuse me, within the block table record, you finally drill down into the actual entities within that um, that are the things that you might see, like in model space or paper space or any other block, um, lines, m text, circles, et cetera, et cetera. So this is this is very simplified. There's a, you know, you just saw Jacob scrolling through like a million things in that that website. Um, this is, I, I'm trying to take that and put this in some sort of a graphic for you so you kind of understand the hierarchy. There's a lot more to it, but this was what I felt was, was salient. So pay attention right there where the little arrow is at the database. Um, hold that in your head and we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's go to the next one. So let's talk about the Civil 3D API structure. A little bit simpler. Um, but looks a little bit um, similar to, to AutoCAD's API. At the root level, you've got your civil application object. Within that, you've got your civil document object. And, and then there's a survey projects ob object there where you can access, well, survey projects. Um, within each civil document, uh, you've generally got a bunch of collections of things like alignments, corridors, um, like point groups, things like that. Um, then you have settings, which are um, the settings that you might access through Toolspace. Um, and then you have a whole separate area for the styles. So the thing that, coming back to the database, um, that object is kind of the thing that is common between like your AutoCAD API and, and, and Civil 3D API. Um, you can access, uh, generally when you're working with the Civil 3D API, you're generally working on the active document, um, but there are some places in the API where you can, you can feed in just any database object and in theory work on um, any other database or any other drawing that isn't the current active one. Okay, next slide. So I'm, I'm big on flowcharts. Um, obviously by now you've seen a bunch of these big spiders that I've put together, but um, I wanted to show you this one and try to give you a just like five steps that you can pretty much do every single time that's repeatable, that's gonna be you know a safe way to access, read and write, um, and it's gonna work. So pretty much you can always, when you're developing a new workflow, trying to access something in the API, you start out, you get the active document, you access the database uh, within that document, then you open up a 
transaction, which I think in the previous Civil 3D um, presentation a few weeks ago, we talked a little bit more about transactions. So I don't want to spend a ton of time on that, but that basically allows you um, that allows you to safely read and write and make changes to something. Um, if you don't do that, you can get yourself into trouble. So best option, just always open a transaction to do your work and then close it when you're done and you should be good. And there's some times where you don't need to, but why not just always do it and don't have to worry about it too much. So you open a transaction, you make your changes to whatever you need to do, create stuff, change a property, whatever, close that transaction by committing it um, and you're done. So there's obviously a lot that's gonna go into that make changes bubble. <laughs> that's kind of the bulk of the work that you have to figure out what to do. But this, if you follow this pattern, um, you know, you should be good. And this is really how the Python node template is pretty much set up. And we'll talk about that um, in another slide about how that, the steps in that um, line by line, how that pretty much matches up with this workflow here. Yeah. Oh. Cool. Let's keep going. All right. So now that we've sort of understand what we have to do to really get stuff. Uh, yes, uh, great question in there. Uh, not committing, basically it's gonna leave stuff kind of stuck in the memory when you close the thing, nothing sort of, exists um uh so great point um oh it, my gosh. it does kind of depend somewhat and that's within civil 3d you can you actually can you can do a lot of stuff outside of a transaction within when working with civil 3d objects it's a little hit and miss and a little inconsistent and so in my opinion again just stay safe put it all in a transaction commit it at the end you'll you'll be good and you don't have to worry about those weird cases where it may or may not happen because sometimes, sometimes I kid you not, I mean, if you don't, with when especially with working with some AutoCAD objects, if you don't commit a transaction, even that that one line, just transaction dot commit, you can just, you can crash AutoCAD. So it's like just commit the thing. It it doesn't. It's not a huge like overhead, you know, performance wise. You just just do it every time. Yep. All right. So. Now that we understand kind of what we have to do to sort of really leverage these pieces and sort of expand up on that right code, um, how do we really get there? Like the .NET API is all written in C Sharp uh, for AutoCAD or Visual Basic, but we're writing Python. What do we do? Well, a uh, few things. First, we got to find out what it is that we have. So um, if uh, we're after running this particular uh, method, uh, we have to then go find, go find that in the reference guide. Uh, and then identify the member type. It could either be a constructor, which is this. Uh, to call a constructor, we're going to call for the namespace, then the class, then the function. Right? And it's important that we call the class, then the function, because we don't have an object to call directly yet. So we have to call that on the class itself. Uh, after that, it could be a method. This is to modify a thing. Uh, this is object.function, where object is the thing that we have that we want to modify. And then property is the last piece. This is information about a thing. This is going to be take the object and pull information from that object. So object dot property. So while things might be written in differently in C uh, C sharp, uh, or if you're looking at Visual Basic, know that. But uh, those will be different as well. In this case, we are looking at the uh, uh, C sharp version. Uh, but the, basically, you're looking at kind of the constructor. Um, right there as namespace dot class dot thing you want to do uh, the method as object dot thing you want to do and then property as uh, object dot property right uh, it is important that you fill in the parentheses for your methods uh, that trail sort of the function call for your methods and your constructors but there are no parentheses trailing the properties those are just available right off the bat so now that we understand what those different pieces are, we have to understand what that thing that we're working with is. Uh, oh, before we get there, we may remember back in session four, it's a long time ago, we talked about how to navigate the library and we had the green plus button, our constructors, the red lightning bolt, our modifiers, and the blue question mark, our properties. Right, so this actually ties back to Dynamo. So once you start to learn the nodes, this can help you sort of modify, uh, navigate this as aspect of Python as, and the APIs as well. All right, so now having said that, uh, we know what it is that we're after. We're after this explode to owner view. 
what does this roll up on, on into? Does it roll up under a constructor, under a block ref, uh, sorry, under uh, methods or under properties? And in this case, it is rolling up under methods. So in that case, to call this, we're gonna say object, the block that we wanna explode, dot explode to owner space, open parentheses, close parentheses, and put whatever the number of arguments are in there. Uh, Python will throw an error if you put the wrong arguments in. Like if you aren't sure, you can always start with it blank. Then if it says expected more references, go ahead and throw the number one in. It will tell you what you need to use instead of number one. All right, so now that we've got that content and we understand how to call it, um, we've got to remember we can't yet see AutoCAD or Civil 3D until we connect to it. So Zach uh, had that those great flowcharts before. How does this all work? So our, our, our relevant libraries have to be imported uh, from Python over because we've got AutoCAD and Civil 3D talking into that common language runtime, right? So AutoCAD data or Civil data can sort of bounce back and forth uh, so that we can pull stuff out, send stuff in. No issues whatsoever uh, within the larger framework of the operating system, uh, but we can't do this. Python can't connect to that directly with the .NET API. So if we can't do that, what can we do? Well, Python can talk back over to the common language runtime just as well, right? So what we have to do is we have to bring the relevant chunks of data uh, over to our file. So we're going to import the common lang language runtime into Python. We're going to import or add the references to the different libraries that we want to use. And then we're going to uh, import those namespaces. Um, note, the less importing you do, the faster your code's going to execute. Uh, and if you find that you have to make them the same 15 changes for every single Python node you ever write, you can go ahead and you can modify those templates by going to the path down at the bottom, program data, Autodesk, Civil 3D version. Uh, slash dynamo slash python template dot py. Uh, you can't change the path to that. You can only modify that. So what I recommend doing is copy that file in place uh, so that you've got the default there as well. Um, and then go ahead and modify the python template dot py as opposed to the copied version. Hey, All right. Yeah. We did have a, a question or a comment that was topical of just a, a few minutes ago by Garrett. Uh, not committing discards everything. That was uh, when you guys were talking about committing your changes, I think it was. Yeah. In the API. And then he said he had a follow up question, maybe for later, but just to remember constructing temporary objects for calculations and then discarding is therefore bad practice. Not necessarily. Um, you just want to do a transaction.rollback to make sure that that transaction is not still sitting there open. Um, we do have the width uh, piece in the Python template that we'll get to here uh, in, in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Um, which closes it, but it doesn't necessarily like discard the stuff that's in memory. All right, uh, give me three minutes and we'll get into something I can talk to that a little bit better uh, on. Um, this is the other uh, sort of key piece here to know. Uh, we are using in uh, everything I'm showing in this demo so far, and I'm not sure what Zach's uh, gonna be showing, but Iron Python 2, not C Python 3. Uh, Iron Python 2 is the default for all versions of Dynamo prior to 2.13. C Python 3 becomes the default in 2.13 and beyond. The Iron Python 2 package is available in the package manager, and both versions are available for Dynamo versions 2.7 to 2.12. So if you start writing stuff in C Python 3, it should back port to any Dynamo version of 2.7 or later. But note, C Python 3 is Python native integration using Python.net as a bridge to talk to the .NET based on Python 3, while Iron Python 2 is different. As such, it, there are things that you will not be able to do in C Python 3 that you used to do in uh, Iron Python. Uh, so it's important to keep that in mind and know that this is a change that you, we are making, uh, not because we want to or because we want to break things on you, but because there are security implications of using unsupported software and Iron Python 2.7 is unsupported at this time. Uh, so uh, try and migrate over to C Python 3 whenever possible uh, and know that that piece is uh, getting better and the Dynamo team is working uh, on that Python engine to make it more robust and stable as things go. All right, so now that we've covered that bit, uh, let's go and talk about all this crazy import stuff. So uh, we, we talked about all those things that we have to get, uh, get in. Let's really break this down. Uh, so this is kind of the standard boilerplate template, and we're going to go over why the uh, sort of big pieces are here. Uh, so the first piece is we're going to import the uh, 
uh, Python engine and the common language runtime um, uh, as sort of step one and two. Uh, once we've got those two pieces, sort of the Python uh, engine as well as the common language runtime pulled down into our Dynamo Python environment, we can continue to move on. After that, we're going to add the AutoCAD and Civil 3D references to the common language runtime. So we're going to add the AC uh, MGD, AC Core MGD, AC DB MGD, et cetera, et cetera, uh, before finally importing the AutoCAD namespace into Python. Uh, so this is everything that we get out of AutoCAD uh, that we typically want to use. And there are other things you might want to pull in, right? Like, uh, I don't know, Sheet Set Manager might be one, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and then from there, we're going to get into uh, the Civil 3D namespace and import those pieces uh, down into the Dynamo Python environment. After that, we set up some of our global variables. Typically, we're at, working on our active document, not ones uh, in the background. So we do that there. Uh, then we pull up our active editor. Uh, so we can start to uh, call on stuff that uses that other editor. And then our inputs, usually for me, I like to see those go in at around line 29. And that wraps up kind of that uh, first half of the, the intro. Second half of the, sort of the boilerplate stuff, we're going to lock the document to ensure that the document's only receiving one input at a time so we don't get sort of read write access errors. Uh, then we're going to uh, get the database out of the, that, that document. Then we're going to start a transaction on that database. And all our awesome new code goes in between uh, that section where it says place your code below. Then finally, we got to push that content back out to the Dynamo environment. In this case, uh, it's setting to put that out to uh, just the number zero. Uh, there can only be one output. You can have multiple output ports. So if you do need multiple, just wrap those in a dictionary or a list. All right, Zach, on to you. OK. Oh, yeah. There. OK, sorry, I had to unmute there. All right, so um, wrapping and unwrapping. So uh, earlier on, Jacob showed um, there was there was a little node there. We had a line and an output like autodesk.autocad.databaseservices.line. Um, I've got similar thing here. Um, so the concept here is that the 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 Dynamo objects, um, like when you uh, when you go to the library and you have the shelves for like object and civil object and things like that, those are basically just taking all of the internal API members uh, um, and wrapping them up into a new thing. So literally just think of it like a, like a candy wrapper. <laughs> and what you have to do then is if you want to take, for example, here on the left in my little image, I've taken a, a line that I just selected in model space, and I want to then access the underlying, uh, a, I'll call it the API object, and modify it i have to unwrap it i have to get back into that that underlying object so um what you can do so all all objects and civil objects um they have a property um called they have two properties one is the internal db object and one is internal object id those are what you can use to unwrap so if you've got this example that I have in the picture is just unwrapping a line. So in the in the top node, I'm just getting the type, autodesk.autocad.dynamonodes.line. If you think of that as like a, a, a Dynamo AutoCAD line, that's like the most confusing statement ever, but <laughs> that's basically what that is. And then that little, I've got a little Python node there that I just, I renamed it line.internalDBObject. And that is outputting um, the internal, the API um, line object. And then from there, you could, manipulate and do something with it. Um, otherwise, you can also get the internal object ID, which is the unique ID of that object. And then you can you open a transaction and, and retrieve that object from the database. That's the other way you can do it. Um, I just put a note, be careful if you just use that internal DB object property. Um, by default, it's not, it's not, a bit, it's not, um, it's not ready to make edits. <laughs> so if you just grab that internal DB object property and try to edit it without getting it into a transaction and, and upgrading its status to be write enabled, you might, you might get a crash. So just, it's not, it's not a saying don't ever use it, but just be careful that you upgrade it, upgrade its write status. Um, if you just use the internal object ID, it can be a little bit safer because it forces you to then get that object through a transaction and then you, and then you know you're working um, with a 
with a saved object state, basically. Okay, keep going. Man, we're running out of time. We got a jam here. Yeah, I'm going to go super quick through this next one so that we've got some time for some demos here. But um, so, how do we deal with debugging? Um, uh, there's a few different pieces that I recommend. First, utilize the line numbers to find where the issue is. So, in this case, you can see uh, this particular node said it's got a problem at line 50 uh, in the traceback warning that sort of popped up here. Uh, this can be a bit late. So we want to go back and actually find it in our code. So we've opened up the Python code, and you see I've got kind of the blow up there. Uh, and then we go and we find line 50, find out what the itch issue was. It was an attribute error. The database object has no block table ID with a capital D is a failure. Uh, so we can go and we can find block table ID with a capital D instead of lowercase d. And I'm emphasizing this because every time I type code from scratch, I always get that wrong, be it in Revit or be it in AutoCAD. Uh, so after we get the ID uh, sort of set up correctly, uh, we can go and we can see, oh, there it is, what's going on on that particular piece. So I can call the doc, uh, sorry, the directory on the DB object and find out how I called that wrong uh, to actually get that uh, property correctly. Um, the other thing uh, to note is uh, to sort of wrapping stuff in a try and accept block. And the way that works, uh, I've made some uh, sort of changes to the overall piece here. First piece is I've imported traceback, uh, which you can see there. I've done that up at line four. And then I've started a try accept statement. Now you want to be careful. You don't want to use try accept to define flow control only for there might be a problem here. So where do we start? So in that case, we then start our try loop. I start this inside um, uh, opening the database, uh, but before starting the transaction personally, uh, there are other reasons you might wanna put it at other points. You can have multiple, uh, but in this case, I think this is a pretty good overall uh, insertion point uh, in general. Uh, and then at the end of my thing, I want to try all of that code that we opened up the transaction and commit it. I output a final message for my results log of sorts. Uh, we could use a list. In this case, I'm just going to use a string, which would be my final output. Uh, after that, uh, after the no worries, we write our accept statement. Our accept statement wants to be where we want to append this thing to and pull the error message out. So in this case, I'm just making the variable msg uh, equal to traceback.format exception. Right. Uh, with that data, that content is actually going to be run uh, out of the code. Uh, you can see I've zoomed in on it there. I keep hitting one too few on these. And then finally, we can output the result of our log, be it the results list uh, or be it the MSG uh, variable that I'm using here out to the Python environment. Uh, with this, you can do a lot of crazy stuff, but it is important that we still save and save as often, because if we don't, you'll do stuff like this. And you can see there, I hit run, nothing's happening. I'm clicking like crazy, nothing's happening. What's going on? And the issue here is I had my open mode on my block table record and my open mode on my uh, block table um, uh, database, uh, or sorry, my uh, database as both set to for read, right? You can see it kind of right up there, my block table and my block table record are both set to for read. And as a result, when I went to write stuff to the block table record and into the block table, it said, no, I'm sorry, you can't do that. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna quit AutoCAD now. Um, that brings us all the way back to me building the, the PowerPoint. So uh, keep that in mind, keep saving often and uh, early. Uh, Zach, we've got seven minutes. Do you, do you wanna try right. and uh, pull something up or? Yeah. That's what, I'm gonna, guess, what we've all been waiting for. So yeah, I, I, I practice ahead of time. Hopefully I can jam through it real quick here. All right, all I'm right. gonna stop sharing while you uh, get stood up. Okay. Right. Can we see in my screen here? Yep. Okay, cool. So um, I have a drawing here with um, a few objects in it. We've got, we've got a uh, existing ground surface uh, we've got an alignment and some couple corridors. Um, there's some assemblies here, profiles, profile views. Um, so first thing we're gonna, I'm gonna show a very quick example of just how do I just like get and set properties. That's a common task that you're gonna probably that a lot of people run into of just like, well, if there's a node, if there isn't a node in my library to just set a property. How how can I do that through? Uh, through the API. So I'm going to start here from, from scratch. So let's just do a, a basic one. We just want to like rename, rename the corridor. We'll just do something like that. Okay. So I'm going to first uh, select the, so 
select the corridor here. Okay, so now we've got we've got a corridor object. It's named corridor two, and we just want to change the name. I know we could use the civil object dot set name node in here, but just bear with me, okay? Because this applies to other properties that may not be accessible, um, and I wanted to pick something pretty easy. So, okay, so I'm going to open up um, Python editor here. We've got that template code uh, that Jacob ran through. So the first thing I would do um, is go to the, usually the first step is just go to the, go to the documentation and try to find the thing that you might be wanting to, to change. So in this case, I know the corridor has a name property, but I'm going to show you the process of where to find that. So here's the civil 3D documentation, um, API reference guide. Um, most objects are within the database services namespace. So we'll go in here. We'll scroll down to corridor. C O, how do we spell corridor? There we go. Corridor. Okay. And we'll go to the corridor properties. So here's all the properties of the corridor that we can work with. And there is a property right here called name. So I'll click on that. Um, gets or sets the object's name. Perfect. That's what we need. So come back over here. Um, I'm this data entering node. I'm going to rename this as core. That's my corridor that I'm going to um, input right here. And then we'll come down. Here's all of our, our kind of boilerplate code to get us into a transaction. Um, I'm going to uncomment this here, the, the commit. So first I'll, I'm basically the steps we're going to do is we're going to get the internal, um, corridor, corridor object, and then we're going to set that name property. So I'm going to call this, I'm going to make a variable, AECC core, I'm going to say equals core dot internal DB object. And here's where I mentioned you if you're going to set properties or change something about it, you want to make sure that it's in a right state. The easiest way to do that is you could just say core dot upgrade open. Um, you can read about that in the documentation. And we're going to say ACC core. Let me add, sorry, let me go back here and add one more input. We're going to have a, the corridor is the first input and then the new name is my second input. And we're going to say AEC corridor dot name equals new name. And then we're just going to output the original corridor object and see if this works. Let me add a string here for our new name. We'll call it uh, Jacob's Beard. And so this one's going to plug this in here and Jacob's Beard. And run it. Okay, there we go. Corridor name equals Jacob's beard. So we reset the we've set a property through here with just a couple couple lines. We'll change it to Zach's cool corridor. Whoops. Then run it. Corridor name equals Zach's cool corridor. Okay. So that's a pretty basic example. We got two minutes, Jacob. I can I can probably jam through a more complicated one, or we can end it. I think let's let's stop it for here, and people can reach out if they they have other questions uh, through the community conversations uh, uh, site. So okay, all right. Um, I was going to show you all how to make some tin volume surfaces and get their properties and all kinds of cool stuff, but we uh, we talk too much. So yeah, yeah maybe maybe we'll have you <laughs> back. on the forum, and we'll help on there. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. All right, so um, let's get into uh, sort of the wrap up. Uh, we've kind of covered the questions as we go, but I do want to cover the coming sessions. Uh, we do have uh, one uh, with uh, Dynamo talking to Formit with special guest Josh Goldstein from the Autodesk Formit team. Uh, then on the 16th, I believe we skip a weekend there, uh, which is kind of nice uh, to give me a little bit more breathing room. We've got Dynamo talking to Alias with special guest Michael Gunther's Geffers. 
Gunther Geffers. Uh, we call him GG here at Autodesk, uh, who's a member of the Autodesk Alias team. Uh, then uh, two weeks after that, on the 30th, uh, we've got Dynamo talking to Robot Structural Analysis in Advanced Steel with Tomas Fadula and Steven Gumpert, both also Autodesk employees. And then more awesome things to come. We're, we've got plans to get into generative design uh, sometime shortly after that. So uh, really looking forward to where this goes. All right, Sean, over to you. Awesome, great information in there. Um, the event page, I, I just pasted a bunch of links in there, but uh, the event page is you can ask questions in there as well. And I put about a bunch of helpful links in there and I'll announce the recording link there too. So we're gonna wrap it up with a few other ways to connect to the and engage in the Autodesk community. And that is, uh, you know, it including the network of user groups in the Autodesk user group, I gave a link to the Dyna Dynamo forums, which are a great resource for Dynamo users. Um, Industry-focused communities, colleagues, business challenge, you've got all kinds of opportunities in here. Uh, you can connect with us on Twitter. We have a, a Voices blog, which is customers for customers. So it's a great resource and anybody can be a author in there if you are a subject matter expert. Um, all kinds of stuff in there, I will paste uh, I got the links in the in the event page, but uh, and in the chat. So thank you everybody for attending today. Uh, make sure to go to the community conversation page and uh, subscribe to the future events. In the future, we're going to have the ability where you can subscribe and be notified and and get notifications. We're working on that. We know that is a a a, a gap in what we need to provide so that more people can be aware of what's there. But if you look at the calendar, that's a good list of what's coming up. So thank you, everybody. All right. And a uh, special thanks to Zachary for, for coming in and presenting Absolutely. to us. This was, this is a blast. I, I really enjoyed getting to present with him and I, I hope to see him uh, around in the community. More. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks for the opportunity. Nice to see everybody. Um, sorry, we couldn't get to a cooler example there at the end, but like I said, if you got questions, put them on the forum and, you know, we can work through it together. So. Yes, great, great feedback in there. You know, uh, uh, fabulous and really clear explanation on the structure of the DLLs by great. Um, we've got uh, Adam, great info. Uh, Dirt also said super well done. So, I mean, this was the deep end of the pool, I would think. Oh yeah. <laughs> so the deep appreciate. End. There's a whole lot more in the deep end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll be looking for the hands raising out of the water. So yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Yes. Bye, all. Take care.